Welcome. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Shubin to you tonight. Uh, you are in for a real treat. Beginning with a love of nature as a child, Neil Shubin has become one of the most prominent evolutionary biologists of our time. He received his bachelor's degree at Columbia University and his master's and PhD degrees from Harvard. He's currently the Robert R. Bensley Distinguished Service Professor and Associate Dean of Organismal Biology and Anatomy at the University of Chicago, as well as Professor for the Committee on Evolutionary Biology. He has also served as the Provost of Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History. Dr. Shubin's groundbreaking research combines the study of fossils with developmental genetics to provide the mechanistic details as well as the big picture view of how anatomical features such as limbs evolve. As an anthropologist, I spent a lot of time figuring out how humans compare to other primates. But as you'll see tonight, Dr. Shubin's perspective on human anatomy goes way beyond primates. And his work has dramatically revealed our deep evolutionary similarities with all vertebrate animals. He's conducted paleontological fieldwork in North America, China, Africa, Greenland, and Canada. His discovery in 2004 of the 375 million year old fossil Tiktaalik made world headlines, but I'll let him tell you about the significance of that fossil. Dr. Shubin is the recipient of numerous awards and accolades, which reflect not only his substantial and significant contributions to academic research and teaching, but his gift for making his work accessible to non-scientists. For example, in 2006, he was named ABC News Person of the Week. But if you ask me, it doesn't get any better than being interviewed by Stephen Colbert on the Colbert Report. His book, Your Inner Fish, has been highly praised, and in 2009, it was awarded Best Book by the National Academy of Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shubin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, excited to be here tonight to be with you, and uh, I want to thank David Hillis uh, for setting this up, Jay Banner, for making it possible, and to speak uh, to the Environmental Sciences Institute about your inner fish. I should say, um, the whole inner fish thing, uh, for me, began about 10 years ago, when I started at the University of Chicago. I moved to Chicago as chairman of the anatomy department in the medical school. And pretty much as soon as I arrived at the university, uh, three of our leading teachers left. Now, it's not cause and effect, I hope. <laughs> uh, but um, these were some of the people who taught our human anatomy course to medical students. Uh, this is the course that's such a formative experience in the, in the, in the career of, 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 of physicians, where they see the human body for the first time, where they dissect it from cadavers, and where they learn thousands upon thousands of names of every structure uh, in the body. It's a very intense experience and often very stressful. And so I remember I, I, I volunteered myself as the course director and I started to teach the course. And since it's so stressful, I came to the laboratories and just sort of hung around the tables, you know, with a body in front of us, uh, hung around the tables with the students to talk to them. And they'd say to me in the first weeks of the class, uh, Dr. Shubin, what kind of doctor are you? I mean, are you a surgeon? Are you a cardiologist? And I said, well, I'm a... I'm a fish paleontologist. And they're like, what? I want my money back. <laughs> they hear this look, like, oh, it ain't going to work. Um, but it soon became clear, after a few weeks in the course, that being a paleontologist, and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist, is a powerful way to teach human anatomy. And the reason why? Some of the best roadmaps for our own bodies lie in other creatures. The best roadmaps for our brain lie in reptiles. Some of the best roadmaps to the basic nerves of our head lie in sharks and other fish. And indeed, the basic roadmaps to our skeleton lie in fish, reptiles, and other creatures. And the reason for that is that in every organ, every tissue, and every cell of our bodies, we have over three and a half billion years of the history of life. That means part of the human story, understanding why we look the way we do, really comes down to understanding our relationship to these other creatures and comparing ourselves to the fossils, to the embryos, and to the genes of everything from fish to worms to microbes and everything alive on the planet today. Now, for me, there was another entree to the inner fish, and that began when I was in school. I remember when I was a graduate student back in the 80s, my professor showed me this um, diagram right here in a seminar. It was 1986, and so we saw it in rough draft. This is a, came out in 1987. I'm using the pointer on the right-hand side here. 
And what you see is what I saw in class, which is essentially what we knew at the time of the transition between fish and land-living animal. What you see on the top is a lobe fin fish, a creature from about 380 million years ago. And on the bottom was what we knew of the earliest land-living animals, limbed animals at the time. This is a creature from about 365 million years ago. And you can see there's just vast differences between fish and land-living animals, even in some of this, or these earliest representatives. And I remember as a student, as a graduate student, saying to myself that this is a first-class scientific problem, that by finding new fossils, by studying animals in different ways, we can bridge this gap between animals that live in water and animals that live on land, simply by discovery. And really, that's what charged my career, and that's what's charged my career pretty much ever since uh, seeing the slide. I'm pretty one-dimensional. <laughs> anyway, so I am, um, uh, sadly to say. Um, so what I decided to do is to try to begin to bridge this gap by trying to find new places in the world to look for fossils. And to do that, I pulled out the rule book that paleontologists have used for a century or more to find new places to look for things. And when they do that, they look for three things, places in the world that have three things. They, have, they look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to answer whatever question they're interested in. Right? Remember I told you this thing's from about 380 million years ago. This thing uh, uh, was first found in rocks about 365 million years ago. So you want to be in that window of time, in the Devonian era. The other thing you look for is places in the world that have rocks of the right type. Not every kind of rock preserves fossils equally well for a variety of reasons. And what you learn as a paleontologist is the kinds of rocks, sedimentologically, that are likely to produce, uh, to contain fossils. So rocks of the right type, rocks of the right age. And of course, it does me no good if my wonderful rocks of the right type and the right age are buried five miles underground, right? I need to have those rocks at the surface so I can see the bones as they weather out. So is it any surprise then when you look in the pages of National Geographic, where are the paleontologists typically working? They're typically working on naked bedrock in deserts and places like that where their wonderful rocks of the right age are exposed to the surface. Well, I was soon to learn that there's another uh, more important variable, and in my case, that variable was lack of money. I started, um, I started my um, uh, first academic job. After graduating from, um, uh, from graduate school and doing postdoc and all that stuff, I started my first academic job here in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, and it's in the southeastern corner of the state. And what you see here is what I wanted was a project that I could do on the cheap. I wanted a paleontological project that I can do on like turnpike tolls and gas money. A project that I could just get in my car and hop and not apply for huge grants because I didn't have enough uh, wherewithal to get those grants and take the risk at the time to do this. So I wanted a project in Pennsylvania. So I pulled out the geological map of Pennsylvania and I'm showing that to you here stripped of everything unimportant. Um, and what you see, <laughs> you see I'm gone. Um, uh, what you see here is in purple where the Devonian rocks of Pennsylvania uh, are exposed on the surface. Rocks of the right age are all over the state of Pennsylvania, about a three and a half hour drive of my home at the time. So it was really kind of a, a wonderful uh, discovery. I was also lucky that a graduate student started with me, and we've been colleagues ever since, and much of what I'm going to talk about with you tonight has really been done in collaboration uh, with this gentleman here, uh, Ted Deschler. Uh, so he's been instrumental in everything that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And so Ted and I have been uh, partners in crime pretty much ever seeing that geological map uh, of Pennsylvania. Remember I told you rocks of the right age are important, so we had those in Pennsylvania. But that other variable is rocks of the right type. And here's where Pennsylvania was perfect. Because if you want to think about what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago, you had Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Harrisburg out of your brain and think Amazon Delta. This is a cartoon of what Pennsylvania looked like at the time, 365 million years ago. <clears throat> you had a um, highlands to the east, Again, I'm pointing on the right-hand side here. Highlands to the east, an inland sea to the west called the Catskill Sea, and a series of rivers that drained from east to west. Now, if you're a paleontologist interested in finding fossils that bridge the gap between life and water and life and land, these are the perfect environments. Why? Because if you have the right exposures, you could sample ancient seas, ancient estuaries, all the way up the meanders of the stream. You can sample all these different environments. So it was perfect. But Pennsylvania was really challenging in another way, is that it's not a desert, okay? It's, uh, it doesn't have great exposures of rocks. Uh, our wonderful rocks, the only way we could find them 
was by following the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation around as they made new roads. So what Ted and I would do is we would find where new roads were being put in <coughs> and uh, we would travel up there as they were blowing up rock. But what happens when they put a rock uh, road in a particular place or want to widen it? They would detonate the rock and in so doing, if they did it in the right place, they would have our wonderful Devonian rocks exposed. This is one of those places and it's a, a red hill of rock. It's called Red Hill, uh, no surprise. <laughs> and here's a, here's a car for scale. I can't see the human. I think there's a human being right there for scale. Anyway, we see the layers here of Devonian Age rocks. And each of these layers is part of the life history of an ancient river. Okay, it's a snapshot of thousands of years in the history uh, of a river. And what was remarkable about this site, and it's just like an hour north of State College, Pennsylvania, on a state highway in Pennsylvania, we're seeing an ancient world. I mean, trucks are whizzing by, you know, honking the horn at us. And as they're, um, as they're whizzing by, we're pulling out unbelievable things as soon as we got on this, uh, this site. First things we started to find were teeth the size of railroad spikes. I mean, and they were coming out as hundreds of them. Um, we started to find the jaws of these creatures. These were jaws like the length of your arm. And here's Ted holding, this is in the early days, in 92, um, holding one of the front ends of these jaws. We started to find fish of all different kinds, a lobe-finned fish with big fleshy lobes at the base. Um, uh, here's a one example. They're heavily armored kinds of fish. And then, <clears throat> in 1995, Ted found, while well, I was up somewhere else, Ted found um, a limb bone of one of the earliest creatures to walk on land. And here's one of them. It's a, uh, it's a humerus, which is an upper arm bone. It compares to our upper arm. But this was the upper arm bone of one of these early limbed animals. And since then, we found femora, which are leg bones, pieces of the head. It's really been a wonderful spot along the sides of the roads. And what we did is, working with National Geographic uh, in the late 90s, um, we um, uh, produced this reconstruction of what that roadside in Pennsylvania looked like. Um, it was a meandering stream, okay, slow moving water, and you can see it's just teeming with life. Uh, on the banks of the streams were some of the first forests and invertebrate animals that lived on land at the time, like bug-like things. Um, there's that giant 16-foot-long fish with teeth the size of your thumb or railroad spikes. There were lots of little um, armored fish and then all kinds of, actually, three or four species uh, of limbed animals. So it really was a fabulous thing. But the more Ted and I did it, the more we realized we had a problem. And the problem was the rocks we were working on in Pennsylvania were too young. Um, these were rocks that were 365 million years ago. We were already finding very, very advanced or derived limbed animals. These were already far along. But it was very clear that in these Catskill rocks, they were called the Catskill rocks, and in these Catskill rocks, we had to move back in time about 15 million years to a time period of the Devonian known as the Franian. That word will mean something to you in a second. So to give you a sense of what we were after and why we had to move back on time, is really we were interested in finding new creatures that bridged a gap in, 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 in anatomy, in evolution. <clears throat> and you need to see that slide I showed you, which motivated all this when I was a student in the first place. You know, there's the lobe fin fish from 380 million years ago on the top, an early limbed animal from Greenland, actually, uh, from about 365 million years ago. And you can see there's all kinds of differences between the fish on top and the limbed animal on the bottom. And let me just run through a few, just to give you a sense of what we were after. Let's just look at the head. Right? What you see on the top is the fish has a conical head, really with, with eyes on either side. That's classic for many of these lobe fins. Um, early limbed animals have a, a flat head with eyes on top. So there's big sort of architectural changes in the skull. There's other changes in proportions and so forth. But that's sort of the easiest one to see. You can also see the position of the eyes are facing up or dorsally. There's another big difference. Is fish, like these lobe fins, don't have necks. They have a head that's connected to their shoulder by a bunch of bones. So when a fish wants to look around, what does it do? It's swimming in space, so it just you know, swims around to look around. You don't do that. Think about when you're doing a push-up and you want to look around. You use a neck. A neck's a nice invention because what it means is you can move your head independently of, of, of your shoulder. And the way that's seen in the first time is in these, in these early limbed animals. Um, and we've, we've lost the bony connection between the head and the shoulder, and there's some specialized joints down there. So the neck is actually one of the big features here. Um, and of course, the fish on top has fins, and the limbed animal on bottom, as the name implies, have limbs with uh, fingers and toes and wrists and ankles. And so really there are big anatomical differences, and really what Ted and I were after 
based on what we knew at the time, was some mosaic of this from rocks about 15 million years older than our Catskill rocks, from, um, from 365, 375 million years ago. So ideally what we were looking for was like a flat-headed fish with fins. That was kind of the, you know, the goal, right? So we had all kinds of plans. We pulled out our paleontological toolkit, our rule book again, and, um, and we um, uh, looked for rocks, places in the world that had rocks of the right age and rocks of the right type to find, uh, find fossils. And we had an idea to work in Brazil. We had an idea to work in the Western United States. Everything changed one day in my office in uh, Philadelphia. I was still a pen at the time. In the winter of 1998, now that means something, uh, we were having an argument, and it was a geological argument, and I forget what it was about, and I forget who won. Uh, it was probably Ted. He knows more geology than I do. Anyway, um, uh, but to settle the debate, I pulled out a college geology textbook, and this is it, okay? It's a college textbook. It's Dot and Batten, Evolution of the Earth, second edition. I think it's now in its 11th edition with a new author. So that dates me. Um, but anyway, in, in, in answering the, the, the question that set off the, uh, the argument, um, we were just sort of you know, hanging out and showing the fat afterwards. You can actually turn up the lights a little bit. It would be nice to see the crowd a tad. Um, we should, we put, bring it up in, the, in a little tad. Um, anyway, so um, in, in settling the debate, we were just sitting around chewing the fat, right? And um, in chewing the fat, I was just you know, flip, flipping the pages you know, ever so slowly. And in flipping the pages, I saw this diagram right here. And in it was exactly what we were looking for. And let me just, I want to work through it with you because it's actually really important. Because it, it's been 11 years of my life sprung from this diagram. Um, <laughs> it says, I know, isn't that sad? It says, Upper Devonian sedimentary facies. What it means is rocks more or less of the right age and probably of the right type. And what you see is a map of North America, right? You can see the United States and Canada and Mexico. And superimposed on that map is an interpretation of the geological conditions that formed the Devonian Age rocks. Okay? So what you see in the western part of North America is, um, is an interpretation that it was an ancient seaway. That's what that hatching means, and those bricks. But these authors in this textbook identify three places in North America that had rocks of Devonian Age formed in ancient like delta sediments, like the Amazon Delta. The first one was our where we knew about before, those were the Catskill rocks, right? They were too young, but <clears throat> they were clearly of that type, so that confirmed it. There's another area they identified, which is uh, East Greenland, um, which again is a delta system uh, from the Devonian age, um, and this has been very well studied since the 1920s. Remember that cartoon I showed you of that limbed animal that launched all this years ago? Um, that came from Greenland in the 20s and 30s. And then we saw this, which stopped us in our tracks, extending 1,500 kilometers, east to west off the, off on the Canadian Arctic was a patch of Devonian Age rocks formed in delta systems. And I looked at Ted and I said, Ted, do you know anybody who's worked up here? He said, I don't know anybody. Do you know anybody? I said, I don't know anybody. And we're like, oh my God, it's been unexplored. I mean, here we have this vast patch of the earth that contains rocks of the right type and presumably of the right age completely unexplored. So it was really sort of a fabulous opportunity. So this is the morning of this thing in 1998, all happening in my office with books, okay? So we decided to run to the library to dig out some of the references that were cited in this textbook. And in that morning, we ran across a fabulous adventure story. And let me just give me a minute to show it to you, because it really, it's, it's wonderful. It starts with this boat, okay? A wooden ship. It's designed in the late 1800s. It's called the Fram, which in Norwegian means forward. Okay? Um, it was designed by Norwegian explorers to go to the North Pole. And it was designed to be a very strong boat that could withstand the pressures of the ice. Okay? So it turns out that this boat, the Fram, is one of the most successful exploration vessels ever uh, devised, ever built. It took Nansen, a Norwegian explorer, to, the, to hit the farthest north in the late 1800s. And 30 years later, it was to take Amundsen on his successful uh, trip to the, to the South Pole. So it went north and south, it explored the Earth. But in the interim, the Fram vessel took this crew here, a very hardy bunch of Norwegian explorers, uh, to the Canadian Arctic. And they spent four years living in this boat, overwintering, exploring the area of the Canadian Arctic that we saw in the textbook. It was led by this gentleman here, uh, Otto Sverdrup. I don't imagine many jokes uttered, were uttered from Otto Sverdrup's uh, lips. Um, however, they somehow lived up there for four years and stayed sane. The hero of this story 
is the youngest member of their crew. And it's this gentleman here, Per Shai. Per Shai, um, we'll come about, in a, I'll show you in a second what he did. So they went up here to Ellesmere Island. See, here's Ellesmere Island. I'm just circling it on the right up here, okay? That's Ellesmere at a latitude of about 72 to 80 some north. And what they did is they, they explored this area here and they would set into these fjords, okay? And Per Shai was the ship's naturalist. He was the Darwin of the boat. What he would do is he'd get out of the boat and he would collect rocks and bugs and, and this and that and the other thing. And he was quite talented. And in fact, what he found and wrote a small paper on it was scales of fish in the Devonian Age rocks, which we discovered in the library that morning in 1998. So very, uh, very cool. However, Per Shai's work was to stop early because he died pretty much as soon as the boat returned uh, to Oslo. He died tragically young. Uh, he was sick during the cruise, uh, and much of his work was not followed up. Cut to the chase to 1970, when this gentleman here, Ashton Embry, Ashton Embry led the Canadian Geological Survey in mapping the rocks of the Canadian Arctic. This was a big job, okay? They had to map the rocks for oil and gas, for minerals and so forth. And he worked like crazy, but he worked with a sledge to map these things, to understand their age and, and how they were formed. And he produced a paper. And this is the paper he produced. You're going to wonder why I'm doing it. There's method to my madness. This is the paper. By Embry and Clovan, 1974, it says, the middle upper Devonian clastic wedge of the Devonian Franklinian uh, geosyncline. That, in English, uh, what that means is that rocks that could be of the right type. <laughs> and then this is the page he produced. A lot of stuff in there, okay? But there were two sentences on this page that literally uh, caused me to swoon. The first is when he's talking about the age of these rocks up there, he says, the available data indicate an age of early to middle Franian. Remember I talked about Franian before? Remember that gap we were looking for, rocks of 375 million years old? These were rocks completely of the right age, completely unexplored. So Ted and I were like, wow, this is amazing. And then the bottom, this is what really stopped us in our tracks. When he's talking about the Fram formation, these rocks, and he's talking about what they are, right. He said, the Fram formation is similar to the Casco formation of Pennsylvania. Whoa! I mean, here we had rocks of the right type, rocks of the right age. In fact, they were similar to the ones that were producing stuff for us uh, in, in Pennsylvania. And he showed in his pictures these beautiful exposures, which paleontologists really like, that kind of exposure of rock. So I said to Ted, I said, hey, Ted, what do you think? He said, um, I'm hungry. This is all happening in the morning. Uh, so we went to lunch. <laughs> and so there's a Chinese food restaurant across from the library at UPenn. And um, we had you know, Chinese food. And I had a fortune cookie. And I kid you not, my fortune said, soon you will be at the top of the world. <laughs> I, I couldn't make that one up. And so, um, so Ted, Ted's like, we're there, we're there, yeah. No. So, so, so we were there, but it took about a year. Uh, it took about a year to make this thing happen. Because, um, you know, permits and logistics. So just let's go through some of this again. So here we are. This is the North Pole. I'm on the right-hand uh, board here. There's the North Pole. There's a flag in the of it. This is Nunavut territory, the Inuit territory of Canada. It's in the Arctic. And here you see the islands of, uh, of, of the Nunavut territory. And what's in red here are the Devonian mapped rocks. So it's vast, covering just an enormous amount of the, of the Canadian Arctic. And Ashton Embry, you know, that formation that was like the Pennsylvania rocks, he called the Fram Formation after that boat, right? Um, it's here, the Fram Formation, at about 375 million years old. Now, this is different from working in Pennsylvania um, because um, it's here, right, where they find the arrow. I can't drive there in my Subaru wagon. I had to, uh, this, is, this, is, this is far north. Uh, it's daylight 24 hours a day in, in the summer. It's uh, dark 24 hours a day in the winter. There are polar bears up there. Polar bears, <laughs> yeah, polar bears eat people and I don't want to be eaten. And, we had, and it's far away logistically. To give you a sense of the logistics, Here's the nearest town to our field sites. It's 250 miles away, and this is a picture of this town, the most northern human settlement, natural human settlement. Uh, this is a picture of the town of 175 people uh, taken in the spring. This is Greece, Fjord, uh, Canada. So it's, it's pretty remote stuff. So a lot of the um, ex work up there really is logistics, trying to figure out how to get everybody up there uh, and home safely along with the fossils. And we rely pretty heavily on these aircraft. Uh, we rely on fixed wing aircraft, a, a, a wonderful um, kind of craft called, known as a Twin Otter, and we rely on uh, helicopters. We're beyond the, a tank of a gas of a helicopter in our field sites. 
So the twins have to bring up you know, the fuel, and then we, we do this leapfrog act. And so because we're so reliant on these, heli these aircraft, the weights are really limiting. Uh, fossils are very heavy, so we can't bring home everything that we find. Uh, the Twin Otter is an amazing aircraft. It has a stall speed of 55 miles an hour. So in a headwind, it feels like it's taking off at nothing, no speed at all. You're pulling your seat up to try to take it off. And it can land, uh, and it can land directly on the, on, the, on the tundra floor. So this is what camp looks like before we set it up. All right, we don't bring a whole bunch of stuff. We don't bring a lot of people. The people are all really small. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, the tubs, which all our food goes in and so forth. So it's, uh, you know, we're really sort of careful about what we bring. So we started this whole thing. Remember, it began in 1990. So we had the fortune cookie in 1998. And um, it took us about a year uh, to get up there. So we started in the western part of the Arctic. And we were, like, really psyched. And this is what camp looks like. We have each of these individual tents. These things can withstand winds up to 75 miles an hour. Uh, there's the um, uh, kitchen tent. It can't withstand winds up to 75 miles an hour. <laughs> Chased it all over the Arctic. Um, but, um, so we, we camp around at the base of these uh, snow fields. And what we do is essentially, you know, you wake up each morning as a paleontologist. This is true for paleontologists everywhere, wherever they work. You get up and you start looking at rock. And you start looking at the ground. And you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, looking at the ground to see where bones are weathering out to see what possible layers are containing the bone. Well, this uh, first year in Greenland, was, I'm sorry, in Ellesmere Island, was notable for one thing, uh, in that we uh, found nothing important. Um, it was uh, pretty much a failure. And the reason why it was a failure was instructive. We learned from failure. And the reason for it was we were in marine rocks. It was an ancient ocean. We wanted to be in the streams, because we knew from Pennsylvania that that would likely be the place. So looking at the maps and the reconstructions, and here's the reconstruction for Pennsylvania, but it applies to the Arctic, is we were in the ancient oceans, so what we had to do is if we wanted to get in the streams, it meant we had to go east, okay? Because the reconstruction for the geology of the Arctic was kind of like Pennsylvania, that you had a highlands to the east, an inland sea to the west, and so getting up the stream meant going east into the rocks. So we went back in 2000, and we went to... Uh, southern Ellesmere Island here, where the arrow is. And this is kind of what Southern Ellesmere uh, looked like in 2000. Uh, a little more relief. But boom, as soon as we went east, we'd gone into those ancient uh, stream environments, okay, which were, were so important. And as soon as we did that, we started to find bones. Not what we were looking for, not flat-headed fish with fins, but uh, bones. Now, it, it took a long time. It took about, what I'm going to give you is about five years' worth of work. And the reason why it took us a lot, about five years to find what we were looking for is because just getting around there is really tough. Um, there's a couple things. Every rookie Arctic researcher does the same thing. They'll be standing here at this rock, and they'll look across this valley and say, oh yeah, guys, I'm going to walk there and back today. It ain't going to happen. And the reason why is several things. The first is you lack perspective. There's no trees. There's no buildings. There's no poles. The air is crystal clear dry. So the distances are collapsed. So you lose that perspective of space. So it took a while to learn that. And the other is just getting around. I mean, you get this loose scree, walking on this boot-breaking scree, crossing the streams, um, just knowing how to work the landscape. Uh, it took us a little while. Um, and also just knowing how to live up there. This is my summer home, okay? And, you know, we set up, I said the tents to stand winds of 70 miles an hour, but when it's higher than that, you know, you've got to put a wind wall up. Um, and so it's, uh, and you sleep with a shotgun because of the polar bears. So there's a lot of stuff to get, uh, to get used to. Anyway, there are lots of creatures like this up there. Um, now, if you could hit the lights for this one, because actually for the next two slides, it would be nice to be a little darker. Um, so this is what we look for. Uh, not that guy in black. Oh, sorry. You don't look for that one. Yeah, hey, he's got it. He's, he's got it. Um, anyway, so this is me a couple of years ago up in the Arctic. Ah, thank you. Um, so so this is, I'm just trying, I hope you can see this. So here is a landscape in the rock. And you can see there's some stuff that's white here, all these little dots of white, if you can make those up. That's bones spilling out on the other side of the hill. So when you're appealing tiles, you're looking for stuff like that. So what you do is you see the bones here and you follow it to where, you know, the highest level of bone and then you dig in the rock. And what you're looking for, and this is the last slide I'll need it dark for, um, is to train your eye to see the difference between rock and bone. Um, and if you look at this slide, you should be able to start to see the difference between rock and bone. The bones here are a little bit whiter. The rocks here are darker, okay? And you start to begin, and each place has a different set of indicators for what fossils are, you begin to see this distinction between rock and bone. Thanks, that's good. I can, we can have the lights up a little bit. 
The big discovery uh, happened in many stages. One of the big stages was the discovery of the site itself. And it happened at the hands of our youngest uh, uh, crew member, uh, a college student from Penn who since went to Yale, uh, a guy named Jason Downs. And this is Jason right there. See that black dot there? That's Jason. Um, and um, this, th this picture is actually really important because it shows Jason um, at the site he was to make his big discovery before he actually made it. Um, and so he got up after this picture was taken, after lunch. Ted snapped this picture just because he liked the view. Jason was to wander off the side here. And then later in the day, unbeknownst to us, we all went home. Unbeknownst to us, Jason returned to the site on walking home. It's about a mile from camp. And he walked this little layer here, which looks sort of greenish. We didn't know it at the time. We went back to camp and we're sitting in the, the tent making dinner. It's around 7 o'clock. And that's the time everybody has to be home. Otherwise, we send a search party. And 7 o'clock rolls around, there's no Jason, our youngest uh, crew member. I mean, still uh, 7.15 rolls by, no Jason. 7.30 rolls by, no Jason. It was, uh, we were getting very scared about Jason. And um, all of a sudden, we hear pop, 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 all these like, footsteps outside the tent. <laughs> Flies open up and everything. He runs in the tent. And there's Jason with his eyes like orbs. And it's like, is he being chased by a polar bear? What's going on? And it became clear he wasn't being chased by a polar bear because in every pocket of his parka and his uh, rain pants were fossil bones. He's going, I found it, I found it, I found it. And he's like dumping all these bones on the table. And um, so these are the bones he was finding. These are like um, fossil fish bones, lobe finned fish bones, lung fish bones, teeth scales and so forth. And you know, Jason's shaking like crazy. I'm like, oh, calm down, Jason. Where's the site? He's like, blah, blah, blah. So we go, um, so, <laughs> so, we, um, so uh, it's daylight 24 hours a day in the Arctic. You know, I grabbed a Snickers bar and we ran to Jason's site. And um, this is us at two in the morning crawling Jason's site, trying to find the lair where all these bones were spilling out. Well, we did find the lair. And it turns out that Jason's bones, this pavement of bones, which was right here, was produced by thousands upon thousands of bones that were weathering out of the rock, from like a carpet of these, of these bones you can see in his hands here. It took us about a year for the next step. And this big step was actually to identify and clear out the rocks from Jason's lair. So here's Ted, and we dug down, and here's, here's the lair. And it turns out when we exposed Jason's lair, those little fragments of bone were produced by skeleton after skeleton of fish piled one on top of the other as they were weathering out. So we just, they, now the plan came, let's expose this layer, like a big dance floor, and see what's what. And that's uh, what we did. Uh, you won't be able to see it, it's too dark, but don't worry about that. Anyway, we have a big hole. Um, <clears throat> um, a big hole in the ground, um, where Jason's layer was. Um, and so this is uh, my other collaborator in the project, Ferris Jenkins, who's a professor at uh, Harvard University. And we were finding lots of little, lots of skeletons in Jason's lair after opening it up. And this is us with one. We're smiling like crazy because of something that's in here. I'll show you in a second. Um, but you, know, you cover them with urethane or plaster and they come back for the ride home. Now in Jason's lair in 2004, in fact in, our <coughs> in the year we were running out of money, this is going to be our last season, so you know, six years after the fortune cookie, um, my colleague here, Steve Gatesy, who's in, in blue, sorry Steve, was removing rocks from Jason's lair where we were seeing bones. And he uncovered this thing right here. So you can see, here's rock. It's all, it's all you know, sort of reddish brown. But right here is a V shape. I don't know if you can see that V shape. Um, that V shape, as soon as I saw it, I knew we had found what we, were, we spent six years thinking about and looking for. What it was, was the bat bottom of a jaw, and then you can see on top of it, in this little crease here, were teeth. It was the snout of a fish. And it was not the snout of just any fish. It was the snout of a clearly a flat-headed fish. And we can tell from that fragment. I'll show it to you in a second. Um, and we knew we found what we were looking at because remember I showed you conical head to flathead? Boom, here we have a flathead right at the right time in the fossil record. So Steve started to etch around this thing to bring it home as a, as a, um, as a, as a block. We capped it in plaster. Um, because the reason why we capped them in plaster or urethane is they come home at the bottom of a helicopter, you know, for the long trip. They come home and then the preparators, and as soon as we removed Steve's fossil, we found three more of these flat-headed fish, ranging in size from four feet long to nine feet long. So we really um, had a hit quite a bonanza. Brought these home, and then the preparators take over. And the preparator, Fred Mollison in Philadelphia, and Bob Masick in Chicago, are really expert. They sit with a needle and a pin vise and remove the rock grain by grain. They can tell the hardness of the bone versus the, um, the rock. This is Steve's specimen. After about five months of preparation, 
Um, you can see that little V shape. This is looking at it on the top. You can see, look, it looks like a, here's a skull. Here's look like an eye coming out. There's another orbit hole coming out. This is after another few months of preparation. This is what's coming out. You can see it looks like a flat head. There's one orbit. There's another orbit. Looks like there's a shoulder. There's another shoulder. And no bones connecting them. There's a neck. I mean, over a period of five months to a year, this creature was being exposed, grain by grain by grain. Every day we'd come back in the lab, we'd find something new. To the point where, you know, here's a fish from about 380 million years ago, before we first find them. Here's a, a tetrapod, which we, at the time we had from about 365 million years ago. Here's the new fish found in rocks that split the difference. This is uh, the creature right here, which had a real mosaic of features. It had scales in its back, like a fish. It had fin rays, like a fish. It has a shoulder girdle with ornamentation, like a fish. Yet, it had a flat head with eyes on top, like an early limbed animal. It has a neck, where the head is separated from the, uh, from the shoulder. And remarkably, uh, when we looked in the fin, it has bones that correspond to our upper arm, forearm, even portions of our wrist. Just to give you a sense, we have a show and tell, which we'll pull out later. Sorry for... This is Steve's specimen, the cast of it, right here. Okay, so this is the creature. Okay, it's about half of it. It's about four feet long. And the first thing we saw, that B shape, was this, like that, sticking out the cliff. So this is what we brought home. It was just a little bit of snout, and everything else was in the rock. This is what Fred Mullison, uh, the preparator, exposed over months. So you come up and look at it after the, after the talk. <clears throat> anyway, so um, you find a new thing. You get to name it. That's fun. So we wanted to give this thing an Inuit name because we had found it in Inuit territory. Okay? And so we worked with the Inuit Committee of Elders. That's these guys here. The Committee of Cultural Knowledge. And we wanted a name that really did two things. That we wanted a name um, that was meaningful to them and to us uh, in their language. And we wanted a name that we could pronounce. <laughs> the name of the committee didn't lend me a whole lot of confidence that we'd come up with a name that we could pronounce. So I was talking to this, this guy here in the middle on the telephone. You know, he, he'd be like in the Arctic in a storm, and I'd be talking to him from Chicago, where I li was living at the time. It was so hard to find a name that meant something to them and to us. They had no concept for fossil. You know, I'd say, well, we found this fish inside the rocks. Long pause. You know, fishermen don't find fish in rocks. You know, <laughs> thought it was absolutely crazy. Um, then he thought, you know, maybe we're making money from the thing. And I, I told him, no, no, we don't make money from these fish and rocks. Then he knew I was crazy. And so um, we went back and forth for a while. And it was a little, about a month and a half of this. Finally, he got frustrated with me. He says, look, just, just tell me what it is and where it lives. I said, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a large freshwater fish. He says, oh, why don't you say so? You got yourself a tiktaalik. I said, a tiktaalik? What's that? He says, a large freshwater fish. <laughs> and I like it. So, in, in so that name stuck. It's actually Tiktaalik, but the Tiktaalik pronunciation uh, stuck. We had multiple specimens of this creature. So here's one of the big ones. And one of the joys of having multiple specimens is this is a, the bottom side of a skull. We were able to take it apart. Um, we took off the, uh, the humerus. And Fred Mollison, the preparator, revealed the entire fin. You take off the fin webbing, and you found, just like our limbs, where we have one bone going to two bones and so forth, this creature has one bone, two bones, two bones. You can compare or make homologies among the bones all the way out to this layer of our limb. And indeed, we were even able to prepare out the bony joints of this creature. Here's the elbow. I'm sorry, here's the shoulder of Tiktaalik. There's the socket of the shoulder. There's the ball and the head of the humerus. Here's the elbow of Tiktaalik. Uh, and here are the various wrist joints. So from that, we were able to reconstruct likely and unlikely motions uh, of the fin uh, of Tiktaalik. And this is the reconstruction as we had it. Tiktaalik is a creature that had both limbs and fins, in a sense. It had gills and lungs. Uh, it had a variety of, of land-living characteristics, like these massive ribs. Uh, it's a real mosaic found just at the right time in the fossil record. And we believe it spent most of the time in water, uh, feeding on either uh, uh, insects or, or insect-like creatures at the time or, um, uh, or, uh, or other fish. Now, the story of Tiktaalik is a great one because I can, I can spend a lot of time telling you about how it tells us a lot about the transition from water to land it and the other fossils we find from that time period. There are lots of other fossils related. It's cousins of Tiktaalik that are also informative. And in fact, it's those comparisons that make the story so, com so informative. But one set of comparisons that really makes the story informative is the way that we can follow, compare identical bones 
all the way from fish, like Tiktaalik here, and even more primitive ones in the fossil record, all the way to us. Remember I told you that in Tiktaalik we see the first neck in the fossil record? Well, over time, following the fossils and the comparative anatomy, that neck we see for the first time in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins is something that becomes our own neck. The wrist we see in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins, the proto wrist, I should say, is something that becomes our own wrist. So every time you bend your head back and forth, every time you bend your wrists, you can thank Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins living in freshwater streams. And this approach allows us to understand our own bodies, just like it did in human anatomy. It allows us to understand some of the greatest puzzles uh, in anatomy to teach, actually. One of the most stressful moments in that human anatomy course for the docs that I taught at uh, the University of Chicago is when they see a slide like this, okay? Um, they look at this and they say, I'm out of here. I got a fish paleontologist and I got this diagram. Get me out of this place. So they have this thing. They have these things called the, cr we have the cranial nerves. We have 12 of these things in our head. This is one of them, okay? And it winds its way through our head with all kinds of branches, just innervating everything. It is it's really hard to learn these things unless you know one important trick that the simpler state of affairs exists in sharks. And indeed, understanding development and evolution helps us make and straighten out this very, uh, very complicated state of affairs. Indeed, it gives us a different perspective on creatures like this one. <laughs> Some people look at this creature and see pinnacle of creation. They see complexity of all, and it, true complexity and beauty, and I do too. Um, however, another thing I see is when I look at this creature is a big, fat old fish. <laughs> and if you, you can, you can compare Professor Einstein to the fish. Uh, I labeled it for you. Einstein's on the left. Um, uh, and you can do it at every level. You can do it with the fossils. You can do it with the genes. You can do it with the embryos and so forth. And you do it in system after system after system. Let's just look at the head. A few weeks after conception in the head, this is what Einstein and us look like. Um, there's the front end. You have a paired primordia for the eyes, developing like these little discs here. And you have a series of, 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 of four swellings, paired swellings, which we've color-coded here, that develop in the, in the base of the throat area. And there are lots of cells in here. And cells are migrating into these swellings, and the cells are dividing in place there. And there's a little cleft between them. They're very complicated structures. Yet if you look at development of a shark, a fish, a turtle, any creature that has a head, let's just look at a shark, head looks a little bit different in development, develops a different timing, but what do you see? You see paired primordia for the eyes and a series of swellings filled with, uh, with cells. And we can map those cells. We can trace what those cells do in sharks and humans. We can look at what gene, the genes are doing in these things. We can look at the level of DNA. Uh, in a shark, you can trace them, and you can see I've done it color-coded here. Um, the um, the uh, light blue becomes portions, it, the cells differentiate, uh, change to become portions of the upper and lower jaw. The dark blue it becomes portions of the gill arch supporting uh, skeleton. Likewise, the rest of them become the skeleton that support the gill arch. Indeed, the cells also not only form the gill arches, but the muscles and bones and nerves that support all that stuff. Okay? What happens in humans? Well, that first arch, that light blue, becomes a portion of your lower jaw and two bones in your uh, middle ear. The second one in dark blue becomes a sort of a throat bone here and some, a bone at the base of your skull as well as one bone in your middle ear and the other two become portions of your, of your voice box as well as the muscles and nerves and bones that support all that stuff. Um, so in a sense, the muscles and nerves and bones I'm using to talk to you with right now and the muscles and nerves and bones you're using to hear me with right now correspond to gill structures and sharks. And it's not just the development, developmental comparisons that force that similarity. It's an understanding of the genes that control that. Similar genes are doing these things. And it's also understanding the fossils. We have fossils that show us the transformation of gill bones to ear bones, as well as jaw bones uh, to ear bones. And you can see this tree of life, as I said on the Colbert Report, in our ear. Inside the ear, we have three bones in our middle ear. And you can trace from sharks to, um, to amphibians to other creatures the reduction of the gill bone to becoming one bone in our ear called the stapes. And you can trace gill bones becoming ear, um, gill bones becoming jaw bones, and ultimately these jaw bones getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, to become two bones in our middle ear. So it's a story. This comparison between gill arch bones and jaw bones and our ear bones is seen in development, it's seen in the DNA, and it's seen in the fossils. So multiple lines of evidence. And that leads to sort of some of the powerful concepts of inner fish, 
actually lie in development. That is, a single cell starts this whole thing off, right? So at some, at, after conception, there's a, a single fertilized egg, which is a cell with genetic information. And over time, this single cell becomes a body with two trillion cells packed in all the right places. Of two trillion cells are all different kinds of muscles and eyes and, and all kinds of things. And how does that information get translated? Well, there's a DNA recipe inside that egg that controls when and where genes are active. There, is, there are interactions with the environment that happen that push that DNA recipe uh, in different ways. Um, and there's, so there's a variety of information, much of which is in that DNA recipe. So we call this transition from uh, the single cell to the two trillion cell thing uh, bodybuilding. So to go from this thing here to go to this creature uh, takes the DNA recipe, takes the environment, and then this creature, uh, hard work and steroids and all kinds of uh, stuff like that. So, um, but the powerful thing here is, is the more we've learned in the last uh, 20 years is that the fundamentals of the DNA recipe that builds bodies is seen in other animals. That versions of the recipe that build our own bodies and are responsible for the basic architecture of our vertebral column, which we see in the concert of genes that are turned on and off, that, um, that dictate in the embryo. They're turned on in the embryo, and they dictate the differences among our verte vertebrae and where the limbs are placed and so forth. Versions of these same genes are seen patterning an embryo like this, which becomes a fly. So the basic DNA recipe that builds different kinds of organs, that builds and scripts the basic architecture of bodies as different as flies and worms and frogs and fish and people is largely the same. So the inner fish story is seen in fossils, embryos, uh, and, and genes. Now you can ask the question, uh, this is where I'm going to close, you know, who cares? You know, who cares that I have an inner fish and I have this basic recipe? Well, if you look at the Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology of the last 25 years, who have they gone to for basic medical research? They've gone to people working on flies, on worms, on yeast, on sea urchins. In fact, two Nobel Prizes awarded to five people in the last seven years have gone to work derived from a little tiny worm the size of a comma on a piece of paper. Yet that little worm, Cenorhabditis elegans, is telling us how our genes are turned off in health and disease, how our cells die in, in various kinds of developmental processes and disease. I like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us, from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the cures and breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will ultimately be derived from flies, worms, mice, and in some cases even fish. I cannot think of a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our evolutionary connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much. One huge coincidence, okay, and then we'll take questions. Um, so, um, this is the Tiktaalik site. Could you just flip the light just one quick thing? Um, this is the Tiktaalik site right here. In the year we found Tiktaalik, Ted's sitting in the, this is, uh, there's a graduate student for scale in the Tiktaalik site, and um, so we're sitting in the hall and we're finding all these Tiktaaliks, and Ted's like, gosh, I've been here before. Jeez, I've been here before. I've been here before. I was like, Ted, calm down. Don't get weird on me. He's like, no, really, I've seen this place before. That night he goes to um, the Ashton Embry paper, and he sees this diagram right here. <laughs> I spent six years traveling all over the Arctic and ended up in the same place that Ashton, the one place that Ashton figured in his type specimen, his type of section of the, of the brown formation. Strange coincidence. I'm sure Dr. Susan will be questioned. I'll turn my mic off and have a question. Yeah, swim bladders and lungs are both hydrostatic organs. They're both organs that are derived from the gut tube, out pockets of the gut tube. One develops on one side of the gut tube, the other develops on the other side of the gut tube. So they are related in a developmental sense. If you look at fish, what you'll see 
is that lungs, having lungs is, the prim is a primitive condition before Tiktaalik. In fact, if you look at fish, almost every major group of fish has evolved adaptations to air breathing. And they do it in all kinds of different ways to breathe air. They gulp air and some of them vascularize their, their, their pharynx. Others vascularize um, the back of the throat. Others have lungs. In fact, the lungs is a primitive condition. And indeed, its variant is a swim bladder, which controls the, uh, the, the buoyancy of the animal. It turns out lungs do that too. And they actually, lungs play a role in the locomotion of these creatures as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's actually not the biggest animal we find. The biggest creature we find is about 12 feet. Yeah, I'm sorry. The question is, what did Tiktaalik eat? You know, um, the, um, It's not the biggest animal we find. The biggest animal we find is about three times the size of Tiktaalik. It's sort of in the middle range. The smallest fish we find, about 14 species, uh, is about the size of your thumbnail. Uh, the biggest one is about 10 to 12 feet long. We've taken the skull apart, not this particular one, but others. And you'll see, if you want to look at this thing, you'll see a row of teeth on the outside and their giant fangs on the inside. It's a carnivore. Yes? Yeah, it was, um, it's a kind of sediment, uh, a kind of occurrence known as an overbank. It's a variant of that in a stream. So it washed out. Uh, and there was a flooding event, and things were buried rapidly in an, in an overbank situation where, they, where the banks of the stream uh, were filled very rapidly and then buried very quickly. So it seems like these sort of pulses happened. We had sort of maybe seasonal floods or other floods that happened over time. So we have actually several of these events preserved in the layers there. Yes? Yeah, so you crack a, if you crack a tooth, sometimes you will feel pain without even knowing you've cracked the tooth, and the pain will be all over your jaw, and it'll move all over the place. And that's the kind of referred pain. It's like how you have pain in a, you know, a kidney problem that has referred elsewhere in the body. And that's actually because of the complex paths that nerves take in many ways. And so um, it, I, I don't, I'm not sure how it relates to insects and so forth, but it really definitely uh, relates to the sort of complexity of the innervation of the trigeminal nerve and what the sensory nerves in the... In the, in the in the jaw, um, but yeah, that referred pain is, is really nasty with the uh, with the cracked teeth. But I, it's, I don't think it's related to uh, having had it. Um, the uh, uh, but it's uh, I, I don't I don't see it as related to say insects or so forth. It's really kind of more related to the architecture of the main nerve that does that trigeminal and others. Yeah. Where do you plan to work next? We're going back to the Arctic. That's what we're doing. So when I go back to Chicago uh, tomorrow, uh, and when I'm back for and at the end of the week. Uh, we're actually planning our, a new expedition to the Arctic. Turns out near the Tiktaalik sites are other rocks. We've returned to the Tiktaalik sites a few times, found them more, we found a bunch of them. We're going to go to older rocks, way older rocks. I'm interested in a different evolutionary transition, one sort of at the base of the tree, the origin of heads, you know, so sort of Tiktaalik 0, 0.0 beta, you know. <laughs> and we're also going to spend one week, if the weather permits, at rocks slightly younger than Tiktaalik to find things more in the tetrapod end, so Tiktaalik 2.0. Yes. Yeah, the, so the question is about the future. Um, okay, yeah, and, um, in terms of evolutionary future, um, well, there's one certainty in our future that the planet, you know, the sun's going to go red dwarf and everything's going to bake and the next habitable planet's going to be Europa, but let's, let's not worry about that yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the... Um, the, uh, but before that happens, uh, humans actually, so we're evolving, okay? We're in a continual war in the microbes that are around us and inside of us. So we are most definitely evolving, both in physiological conditions as well as uh, our resistance to disease and other things. So at a physiological level, um, you can see the imprint of natural selection still acting on human populations. That being said, if you think about um, what controls our performance, you know, um, going forward, 
And for most of us living in developed societies, most of us who have access to technology, it's really going to come down to the technologies, the gizmos and medicines we take that extend our lives and enhance our performance. I mean, it's, you know, it's already happening in, in ways that are so subtle we're not always noticing it. I mean, we notice it in, in cases where we take records like baseball statistics, right, where, and bicycling. Um, but those, but in day-to-day in, in -day life, it's, uh, we've come to rely on technologies in so many ways uh, for our performance. Just imagine coming back in 500 years. You know, what will human performance be and what it will be driven by? It's not going to be Darwinian evolution as much for most of us living in developed societies. It's going to be the, uh, the access we have to technologies that will make us stronger, make us run faster, make us smarter. You know, it's, you know just like baseball records are tough to judge now with, uh, with steroids, just imagine what's going to happen with... Uh, the brain implants and how they're going to award the Nobel Prizes in, uh, you know, in, uh, in 200 years. Are they going to give it to the scientist or the person who designed his or her brain implant? <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I, I don't see, I mean, it's, um, I don't see it stopping, really. I mean, any more, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we're affecting it. You know, so I'm wearing glasses right now, so Darwinian evolution is acting in a different way. If I wasn't wearing these glasses, I'd be dead, you know, because I can't see. And living in a, um, uh, you'd be hit by a bus or eaten by a tiger or something. But, um, in whatever civilization I'm living in. But, um, but, you know, but that's actually, you know, that kind of thing is obviously uh, affecting us. But so much of this, you know, when we evaluate the fitness of a trait, we actually define that fitness uh, in relation to a specific environment, right? So the environment's changed from my eyes. The environment includes this, this gizmo here. And so, um, you know, it's a complicated answer. Yes, there are, you know, it's always the law of unintended consequences, right? You launch in one direction with one technology, you're dealing with a complex system, all kinds of other stuff you don't even anticipate are happening, so... Yes, question there. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, think about, yeah, dogs, absolutely, and cats. And, yeah, but, but it's, it's already happened to them, right? We've domesticated them. The dog you see, the pigeons you see, I mean, the, the, the animals we see around us are really kind of oddballs. They've been manipulated by humans for 150, 200, 300 years in many cases, cats and dogs and others. Uh, likewise, the agricultural crops. We're already manipulating that stuff to the point where we've reduced the diversity in the natural world down to one or two species of these things. You know? So we're, we're pretty good at manipulating those, and it's only going to get better. And I don't, I don't mean good always in a, great, in a, in a positive way. Yeah, there's th a bunch of hands back there. So, Okay. Mind, yeah. So um, what, what we know about, the question is about Tiktaalik's mind. Um, we don't know much about how it thought, but we know from the shape of the inside of its skull what it brain, its brain likely looked like. And its brain looked something like a lungfish, which, ex which lives today. So Tiktaalik is not going to be able to do crossword puzzles or, um, or win any contests, but it can do very well in its own environment. It was actually a very successful animal in its own environment. Yes, and the, there are two questions in the back. Yeah. Well, hair, so basically hair um, is a derivative of the skin tissue. So it's, it's the same battery of genes that are sort of uh, responsible for producing feathers and, and hair and so forth um, uh, uh, are manipulated in different ways to produce these things. So there's no fossil record really for the early stages in the evolution of hair. What we have to compare are the batteries of DNA, uh, genes or pieces of DNA that interact to produce these things. And it's really kind of manipulating the interactions of the genes present in multiple layers of the skin. The skin has many layers, and there's one sort of really deep layer that has a lot of genetic information in it. And it's the interaction of those layers that produces these different tissues. Yeah, there's a question. Next. Oh, fish, have been, yeah, fish have been pretty good at evolving things. And so um, they are... Um, well, we're the main, you know, our lineage. So if you look at the branch that's derived from fish, or things we call fish, um, with fins. So if you look at the, the things that have evolved from finned animals, that includes everything with a limb. That's amphibians, reptiles, things we call reptiles, mammals and birds, that dinosaurs, snakes, everything uh, has arisen from, uh, arisen from fish. 
Now, what's interesting about fish is they are incredibly successful with the fish body plan of living in different kinds of environments. There are many different kinds of fish alive today that live in the mudflats that can breathe air. The mud skipper, for instance, flops around in the mud. There are fish that climb trees. Uh, you know, so there's fish can do all kinds of things. You know, so they're, they're very successful and they've been around for a very long time. Yeah, there's a question back. Oh, don't go there. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's nice to think about home run hitters, you know, hitting uh, 300 home runs in a season. Uh, the ocean, I, I'm a less uh, sanguine about, right? I mean, it's the future of the ocean. Uh, all you have to do is look at uh, uh, Jeremy Jackson's website, Shifting Baselines, for, to, to, bre to really depress you, showing how we're really fundamentally changing the biodiversity of the oceans uh, through our actions, not only through habitat loss, but through changing, you know, locally critical environments in the oceans themselves. So it's, it's fairly bleak, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. <coughs> the size of the ribs? Those are massive ribs. I did, would not have predicted that. I mean, there's a, those are ribs that suggest an animal is sort of living in gravity. Um, and I didn't really expect that at all. Uh, the other big surprise about the telex, and I'm not saying this is a joke, is just how common it turned out to be. You know, we worked six years to find this thing, and as soon as we saw it, they started popping up everywhere. You know, it's not at all rare. And there, I should say, it's not only limited to the Canadian Arctic. The cousins of Tiktaalik are present in Eastern Europe. They're present in Quebec. Uh, there's going to be a new creature described from China eventually. So, I mean, there's, um, you know, they're actually fairly common. It's, a, it's a, quite, a, quite a robust part of the tree of life. Yes. What would she do? Uh, so, I, you know, just follow your interests. Read a lot. I mean, that's what I did as a kid. I mean, my whole interest really came about from, uh, I really like nature and hiking, collecting rocks, salamanders, frogs, bugs, that kind of thing. And then, you know, then I went to college and found that somebody might even pay me for doing that kind of thing. <laughs> so I studied really hard so I could get paid to do that. You know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that's not remotely trivial. And so, um, <coughs> so the question is, how do you get funding for this? So you had the idea, you know, so you're doing high fives over a fortune cookie. How do you turn that into an expedition? So um, the, the, the trick, I think, for us was to try to find as many different sources of funding as possible. There was no one source that paid for everything. We had a private donor, a family, that paid for quite a bit. Uh, we had grants from the National Science Foundation. I had a, we had money from... Philadelphia from the Academy of Natural Sciences, from Harvard University, where Farish, my colleague, was from, from you know, University of Chicago. We really cobbled it together all over the place. So it's not like we sent one grant application to some place saying, uh, we have a good idea, will you please fund us? Because that never would have worked. We sent it all over the place and asking for relatively small amounts of money from lots of different places. Yes? Well, it's just like science. It's what science is all about. It's about prediction and discovery. What we make is predictions, and we go out and find stuff in the world that either shows those predictions right or wrong. And when you show them right, that confirms your ideas. And it's just a basic human activity. And science allows you to make those predictions, to show you, the, you, know, the, you know, whether your theory is right or wrong. Other, other ways of knowing are not that powerful to do that. That's what makes this unique. And a scientist at his or her very core has to be able, based on the predictions and based on the evidence that you find, has to go with the data whether your cherished theory is right or wrong. That's what it's about. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, fresh, these, these kind of freshwater ecosystems we think are fairly new for this time because really they're dependent on having stabilized banks and the kinds of plants and shrubs and root systems and soils uh, are, are sort of new to the scene, you know, within 40, 50 million years of the Tiktaalik site. So that's one thing. The other is, <clears throat> it's really, you know, you think about it, the, the invasion of land happened in sort of multiple stages. And, you know, there are several stages where plants sort of conquered land first, right? They were the first ones there. 
then invertebrates, and then finally the vertebrates. So the vertebrates, these other uh, groups, really already set up a habitable system in many ways, both in terms of livable freshwater ecosystems, but also in terms of the um, uh, in terms of the availability of resources on land. There was food on land. And land, if you compare land to water, at this time period, you know, water's loaded with big fish that'll eat you, and you have to compete with. Land, you know, there's food and kind of nice beach and nothing to eat you, you know, so. Um, that's actually trivializing, but that's one, you know, that's, it, so it's that sort of duality between a, you know, a, uh, a, a, a land environment which is sort of predator-free and competitor light versus water, which is more intense. The other piece about the freshwater ecosystems, and maybe it has something to do with oxygen content as well. With the you know, decaying plant matter present in all these streams and all the sort of bacteria that'll sort of suck the oxygen out of the waters and chemical reactions in, in there, it could be that there's a decrease in oxygen content in the water in these plant choke streams with decaying vegetation. Yeah? Yeah, well, so what I can look at is, um, I could look at a lungfish, which is further down the tree. So if you look at the tree of life, I can build it with anatomical traits and I can build it with genetic traits. Using anatomical traits, I'll have a tree of life in this part that has a coelacanth, has species of lungfish, has a bunch of fossils, and then has limbed animals. So the comparisons we do are actually in my lab between lungfish and other fish and living animals. That allows you to triangulate and, and, and and make a, a clear-cut hypothesis about the kinds of genes that Tiktaalik likely have. We know, I mean, it's trivial to say Tiktaalik had DNA, and given the fact that every uh, backbone that we know of, of every animal on the planet, is patterned by similar kinds of genes, it would be kind of bogus to say that Tiktaalik uh, had a different set of genes patterning its back. Now, there are places where you can make those kinds of hypotheses with some robusticity, and you can be fairly confident, and there are other places where you can't. And the trick comes down to having enough data to know when to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the question is, did Tiktaalik have any natural predators? And the answer to that is almost certainly yes. That uh, there were some big monster fish in these streams up in the Arctic. Uh, one with a wide head. This isn't it. But one with a head that looks something like this. This is a tetrapod, a flathead tetrapod from slightly later. Um, but, um, yeah, it's a flathead. Um, but there are, there are big fish with heads, you know, not this flat, um, but with this size, living with uh, Tiktaalik. So, yeah, he was, you know, chomp. That would be not so good. Let's do a kid, yeah. Okay. Yeah, made out of the hat. Like Colbert? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, we certainly swim like them. No, I don't. I mean, you could. I mean, you can actually add. A, I mean, so you can turn on ancient genes. If genes are still active in us, you can actually turn them on in some ways. But can you? You know, one thing you'll see in human populations. One of my son's friends' moms. I, she's in Chicago right now, so I can talk about her. Uh, actually, uh, actually, it was born with a gill slit, an open, an open slit between the first and the second arch. You know, so it happens actually naturally where some of these structures will, in development, sort of retain their fishy characteristics.